Glory to Jesus Christ. Slava Isusu Christu. Welcome to part nine of this explanation of Divine Liturgy and Anthology for Worship. Uh, today what I, I want to deal with is uh, two discrete issues. Uh, I want to return to the question of fixing the accent. And the last time we actually um, looked at the example of um, the Holy God by Pornjansky uh, set up on the page. Um, at that time, I was just focused on the whole uh, question of it as an alternating uh, chant so that people are not always just singing the, the Festal Galician one that you see on uh, page 119. If, uh, if we could have those uh, two PDFs flashed up on the screen again. Um, so because you've now become familiar with these two uh, different chants, what I want to do is uh, point out to you how the, the Bortniański chant is frequently, I'll use the word, massacred in some of our parishes, and how it has been corrected here. So let's look uh, now at page 118 again. What you see is uh, the following chant. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Now, how is that usually sung in a lot of our parishes? Okay. Hold your seats, or hold on to your seats here, because it's uh, for those who have gotten used to uh, singing this in a much more rational way. This is going to be a little bit jarring. So, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Two things. In English, we say holy. We don't say holy, right? So if you sing holy and immortal, have mercy on us, you're misaccenting the word holy because you're saying holy. And in the second phrase, have mercy on us, you're saying have mercy on us. Whereas the phrase actually goes, have mercy on us. So the two syllables that uh, are accentuated along with the two words is mercy and us. So you're not going to stress the preposition. Now, I have to admit that um, for years, I had been struggling with what to do with this because I certainly grew up singing, Holy and immortal, have mercy on us. That, that second phrase we corrected back in, in the 70s, uh, but a lot of people continue to sing, have mercy on us. But that, that first problem, the problem with the proper accent on, on holy, is something that that just um, eluded me. Fortunately, um, people like Michael Thompson in, in our group uh, were able to help us resolve this one. And you'll ask yourself, well, how is it that holy and immortal, how does that resolve anything? Well, again, listen to this. So the Lee is not being stressed. And even though the and, the word and, ends up getting a little bit more stressed than we would like, at least that's happening on an eighth note. So it's a kind of transitional note, which, by the way, uh, speaking of grammar, I mean, conjunctions are, are kind of transitional. We rarely say and, you know. I mean, if you're doing that, you're doing that for special effect. So um, that is... Another example, in the past I've given you examples of how we altered glory be to you, O Lord, glory be to you. Uh, there were um, examples with regards to the, the Lord have mercy that, that I provided. This time 
It's the holy God uh, that, that has been fixed, as it were. And uh, I realized um, uh, during the break between recording um, video eight and nine that I had made reference uh, during the, the, the previous uh, video to the fact that the, the second holy God here, the, the, the festal Galician one, um, really in many ways is, is, is not a kind of optimal chant. It's, it's caught on because of its folksy nature uh, within a church that has a, a very kind of popular dimension to another as being a church of the people in a way that sometimes maybe other churches uh, haven't been, at least historically. So um, I, I think I should kind of finish my thought on, on that front. As, as I pointed out, um, saying holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us while singing a waltz is a little bit odd. And it's actually Professor Boris Kudrik, who uh, ended up, by the way, dying in the Gulag, uh, who was a, a renowned professor of sacred music at the Greco-Catholic uh, Theological Academy in Lviv, the Hrakotolska Bolsovska Akademia u Lvovi. He was the one that in his uh, history of, of Ukrainian sacred music pointed out that uh, by the tw early 20th century, we were developing uh, certain tendencies within our uh, Galician chant that had the quality of, of kind of uh, American cowboy culture. Now, I'm not suggesting to anyone that they stop singing the holy God that's on page 119. Okay, if we could just see that on the screen again. Um, but let's face it, if you have a... Uh, you know, have to choose. In other words, if you're going to choose one more often than the other, I would definitely go with a Bortnyansky piece. The, uh, the, the, the piece on 119, obviously, it's, it's the kind of thing that's entered into our DNA where we're never going to uh, suppress it, nor should we maybe ultimately even think of doing that. But, but certainly, um, the reason that it is the less optimal chant is, is because of the kinds of things that uh, Professor Boris Kudrik, who, by the way, was just a, a genius in so many ways, because of the kinds of things that, that he pointed out in his history of, of, of Ukrainian uh, sacred music, actually Ukrainian church music. Let's move on now to uh, another issue. Now, this is a, a, a completely separate issue, but it comes um, uh, or shows up right after the, 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 the parallel pages uh, for Holy God. This is on page uh, 120, and for this you're actually going to have to go out and buy the book so you can follow along uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, we're not going to flash up a, a PDF on the, on the screen for you. Um, and this has to do with an issue that for very bizarre reasons has become a controversial issue, at least in, in some of our communities. So you'll notice that on, on page 20, there is a rubric. It says, it's right smack in the middle of the page. According to tradition, in order to include the congregation in the singing of the Prokimenon, by the way, the reason that the Greek form is used there, not the Slavonic, is because Prokimen is originally a Greek word, and when you're going into other languages, you're obviously going, for example, in English, you're going to say Prokimenon because it's a Greek word, um, instead of you know, saying Prokimen. Now, obviously, when we speak to each other in Ukrainian or any other Slavic language, we, we will certainly say Prokimen, but formally it's a Prokimenon in, in English. So it says here, in order to include the congregation, the singing of the Prokimenon, the lector may introduce the Prokimenon thus. So here you go. The Prokimenon in the first tone, page 332, uh, whatever the text is, uh, with Hospodeh, uh, may your uh, mercy, Lord, be upon us as we have placed our trust in you. I think that's the, the English translation here, okay? Now, I mentioned uh, controversy. For strange reasons, uh, and it's basically because this was preserved in some of the Slavic churches and then dropped out in other Slavic churches, there is this perception that singing out 
the, the tone of, of something, and in this case, then also singing out recto tono, the prokimenon, is somehow some kind of Muscovite uh, extrinsic uh, innovation that uh, dare not be admitted into the practice of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church. Now, the reason I say this has got to be one of the most bizarre perceptions is because anybody who knows a little bit about liturgical history uh, or knows a lot about liturgical history realizes the following. The Prokimenon is a responsorial chant. It's intended to be sung by the entire congregation. You know, when you go into a Roman rite or an Anglican church and they've got a responsorial chant and the cantor gets up, sings it the first time and then raises his or her hand to indicate to everyone that they're supposed to join in and then they repeat that. Well, that's just like a Prokimenon. The Prokimenon is a Byzantine responsorial chant. Now, if you want to get people to sing that chant which properly belongs to them, how are you going to do that? You say, well, why would we want to do that? We haven't been doing that for a couple of centuries. That's right, we haven't been doing it for a couple of centuries because there are all sorts of things that got lost once there was a higher rate of illiteracy. In other words, uh, you had just a couple of cantors who were able to read variable texts so the people were shunned out of, or shunted out of, 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 of that particular part of the divine liturgy. And also, of course, once this perception develops that, well, we've got to get it over with as soon as possible, so why would we want to you know, prolong the divine liturgy by having the people sing the Prokimenon? But if you're going to actually follow the mandate of the Second Vatican Council and restore fundamental elements of the divine liturgy to their proper place, then you're going to try to find a way to get the prokimenon, a responsorial chant to be sung by the people who are supposed to be singing it. Now, they're not going to be able to sing it if they don't know what it is. So you have to announce the text and you need to announce the page because, you know, they're not going to look into the bulletin for that, they're not even going to necessarily read the very helpful gray box that you have here that lists the pages for all the Prokimenon. You're going to have to announce it. Now, what I never want to see anyone do is actually interrupt the heavenly transcendent aura of the Divine Liturgy by all of a sudden saying, and now Please turn to page 332, the Prokimenon. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us as we have hoped in you. Let me explain what I mean by transcendent heavenly aura. According to the authentic Byzantine tradition, and by the way, this is something that Pope Benedict XVI picked up on very, very directly. Okay? According to our authentic Byzantine Christian tradition, everything that we're doing in church, in that church building, is ideally simply a copy of what's happening during the eternal heavenly liturgy. Now, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you an example. Janet is going to flash up on, on the screen in a couple of minutes um, uh, a kind of um, illustration, a very visual illustration of what I'm getting at here. But the, the issue is the following. If, in fact, our worship here in this church building is a copy of something that's happening in the heavens, and what's happening in the heavens is non-stop, eternal, then we have to find a way at the level, level of semiotics. And what is semiotics? Semiotics is simply a study of the way in which signs work. So we need to find a way to communicate the fact that what we're doing here is a copy of the heavenly realm, because, in fact, our worship is being subsumed into that heavenly realm. Now, how do you do that semiotically? You do it by not drawing attention 
to the seams that bring or keep the liturgy flowing. So if I all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot, we're seeing everything, and then all of a sudden there's this grinding halt and somebody, you know, with their very pedestrian voice announces into the microphone, now please turn to ba ba ba. you have destroyed the transcendent heavenly aura. To make even those markers, those instructions become part of this flow, part of this the movement of us being subsumed into the heavens, even a very, very kind of mundane announcement is made part of the flow by singing that announcement. So you've just stopped singing. We've just finished the, the, the Tisagion. Holy and immortal, have mercy on us. And the priest goes, uh, let us be attentive. Peace be with all wisdom. Let us be attentive. And the lector says, page 332. And by the way, that's probably the better way to do it. In other words, to announce the page first, because that gives people a chance to actually find that text while the cantor then continues. Page 332, the Prokimenon in the first tone. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us as we have placed our trust in you. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us. I'm sorry, you know, I only started using this translation about 10 years ago. I was told to, to learn everything by heart, so I, I apologize for not knowing this by heart, which is probably um, why these books should be selling uh, in greater numbers among older people like myself. But I hope you understand what I'm getting at. And uh, to, you know, unfortunately maybe belabor this, it's a matter of making a couple of things very clear. We want the people to be able to participate. They therefore need to know on what page the item is, and they need to find out in such a way that doesn't destroy the transcendent ethos of the divine liturgy, because part of a transcendent ethos is elevated pronunciation or elevated expression, and there's nothing more elevated than singing. So I hope that will put to rest uh, some of the bizarre polemics that, you know, surround the, this whole discussion of, you know, announcing the, the Prokima in its tone, announcing page numbers. Uh, it's, it's an adaptation that is very much uh, needed. Um, because of our desire to include the people and to just get back to something that I mentioned about liturgical history. The, the reason that it, uh, as I said, is really funny that anybody would consider this idea of announcing the Prokimen tone and the actual Prokimen text to be some kind of, you know, Muscovite intrusion is because as late as 1690, in the liturgicon of the Catholic Metropolitan of Kiev, Kiprian Zhukovsky, we find even in the rubrics for the so called Chtomaya Liturgia, in other words, the Chetana Služba Boja, the Red Divine Liturgy, even in the rubrics for that form of service, which you can imagine, I mean, that's, that's a, 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 obviously a rather Latinized innovation, you know, to have just an entirely red divine liturgy. Even there, the rubric still says, and the reader announces the Prokimenon tone and the Prokimenon. So I've frequently been brought to hilarity when people have, have, have said to me, you know, the Prokimenon in the third tone, uh, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit uh, rejoices in God, my spirit, that that's uh, some, call, some kind of whatever foreign imposition within uh, the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic tradition. Uh, I've, I've been brought to hilarity because at the height of the, the kind of Latinizing tendencies within our church, we still held on to a very, very old rubric, which uh, 
was there because at one time uh, the, the, the church wanted everyone to be able to participate in the Prokimenon. So I hope um, that has been helpful uh, in dealing with um, uh, certain issues that frequently come up. Um, with time, I will provide you with a, uh, a bibliography that will be available on the Sheptisky Institute website so that some of these issues that I've just hinted at um, can be read up on in, in a more detailed way. I've reflected on almost everything that I've been saying here during the last nine videos in, a, uh, I would like to think, a, a rather trenchant scholarly way in all sorts of scholarly pieces. Some of you uh, are not interested in that scholarly uh, approach, you know, all the footnotes, uh, you know, all the fancy lingo, but others may be, and uh, so hopefully with the next couple of weeks that bibliography will become available. And, and certainly I will be spurred on to provide that kind of bibliography if I get a little bit more reaction from some of our listeners who will hopefully uh, indicate to me what they find helpful about these videos, what they find less helpful, and certainly some of the topics that they would like to see me take up in the future. Glory to Jesus Christ. Slavis Jesus Christ.